Life in the military family can be full of ups and downs, but for many who serve, the most difficult, difficult part can be start the day they hang up their uniform and return to civilian life. Stay with us as we talk with veterans, family members about life in transition. I've listened to you bellyache about moving to this new town. This said bellyaching will end as a 15, 30 hours. Will not affect the morale of the squadron henceforth. Do I make myself clear? Yes, yes sir. sir. I know it's rough to leave your friends and move every year. But you are marine kids and can chew nails while other kids are sucking cotton candy. And you're Meacham's. Meacham's a thoroughbred, a winner all the way. Gets the best grades, wins the most awards and excels in sports. Meacham never gives up. I want you hogs to let this bird know you're here. I want these crackers to wake up and wonder what the hell blew in a town. Okay, hogs, by nightfall I want this camp and inspection order. Do you read me loud and clear? Yes, yes sir. sir! I said, do you read me loud and clear? Yes, yes sir! sir. <laughs> Outstanding. Sergeant, dismiss the troops. This mess. He does remind me of someone from the movies, but it's not Rhett Butler. Who's that? Godzilla. Thanks for tuning in to Veterans Voices. I'm Nathan Johnson. Tonight, we will be talking with the families of veterans, and we invite you to join the conversation. Call us at 925-313-1170. Send us a message through Facebook at Veterans Voices One, or email us, veteransvoices at ContraCostaTV.org. Good evening. I'm Erin Escare, and while that movie clip from The Great Santini shows a very extreme side of life in the military family, tonight the families of veterans will share their real-life stories with us. So I want to welcome Christella Hudson and her daughters Gabriella and Yulena to the show. Welcome, ladies. Thank you. Thank Hi. you for having me. <laughs> so you guys got a, got a chance probably just to see the clip. I'm not sure if you heard it, but... Just like you two ladies, I am a child who grew up with military parents, one that actually did a full career in the Air Force. And I know you two young ladies have also been um, a part of a military family as well. So Gabriella, I would love to hear from you and you can talk to us a little bit about your veteran in your family, who that is, and how you have experienced the veteran life as a child? <laughs> um, so my dad, he is a Marine. And um, ever since I was little, um, I thought he was my little superhero. He would always be there. And every time he deployed, I thought he'd be back in like a day. And <laughs> Over time, I'd be like, where is he? And just six months of him being away, people say like, oh, six months isn't that long. To like me, it felt like three years had gone by. Wow. And I didn't like it at all. I kept saying to myself, um, well, when is he coming back? Um, is he okay? Um, and those few minutes that we get to FaceTime him in a day, I was like, are you okay? Did you lose anything? Are you okay? Yeah. That must've been very scary and, and probably very confusing. And Yulina, I know you've experienced a little bit of that. To, to what extent did you guys know where your dad had gone and what he was doing while he was deployed? 
or even he, generally his role in the military, what, what his job was in the military? Well, when he first deployed, I didn't know like what he was doing. I just thought he was like going somewhere and he would be right back. And that's when my sister started crying when he left. I was like, what's going on? And then when he wasn't coming back for a long time, I realized, okay, this is something different. This is not a trip to the grocery store at Mm -hmm. all. So for you, mom, like, did you find it um, maybe challenging or difficult to kind of explain to the girls, you know, like what dad's doing and, you know, how long has he gone for, you know, were those conversations for you tough? And, you know, how did that look for you? It was very difficult. Um, Yulina didn't really understand it because during her first deployment experience, she was three years old and Gabriela was four. By the time the second one came, they were a little bit older so that they had a better understanding that he was going to be gone for a long time. Uh, Still was hard to explain and sometimes uh, hard to kind of make the time go by fast for them. I mean, try to keep them busy. That was the challenge, I guess. So the days, you know, will go by faster. Did you find maybe, um, I mean, now, now your husband is now a veteran, so he's no longer currently serving, um, in the Marines. So, you know, what did that transition look like for your family, for you girls, for you, um, Christella, how did that kind of look as the transition was happening and you guys are settling into a, a civilian life and a, just a whole different battle rhythm? <laughs> yes, of course. Um, to give you just a short, um, background on now is um, Mike served 25 years in the Marines and we've been married uh, almost 16. So during that, during the 16 years we've been married, he, he did five combat deployments, uh, three Iraq and two Afghanistan. So the first three, we didn't have children. So the last two, we did have the girls. So, and also during that time we moved about eight times in five different states. However, the biggest challenge, I think, for him, mostly, I think it was when, like Nathan said, took off the uniform, and now he has to start a new life as a civilian um, man. And and that was very challenging for all of us. One, because uh, we didn't know where that was going to be. It was going to be our last duty station, which was Houston, Texas. We was it back to California, where he's from. We decided to come back here. But I have to say one thing he always repeats is when the phone stopped ringing, it became very lonely and very quiet for him. He had a work phone, and his personal phone, that never stopped ringing, I think, the entire career. He was always busy, always going, always doing something. And the day he retired... Uh, that stopped. And it was very, I think that was very hard for him. So nobody was calling, nobody needed him anymore in his job. And and transitioning and and, and finding other things to do, it took some time and they need the time to do that, to figure it out, okay, what's next? What's out there? What can I do? And for everybody, everyone goes through that, but it's different for everyone. And, and I think it's important to provide a lot of support as much as you can uh, in the sense of just reassuring that we're going to be okay. Take your time. It's important. Yeah. So a lot of challenges come from not necessarily more happening, but since, but certainly less happening, less moving around, less people depending on you. Gabriela and Yulina, <clears throat> how has that been in terms of an experience for you, you have more of your dad at home. He's not deploying as much. Uh, of course, I would imagine every little girl would want their dad to be around. Um, but as your dad has transitioned into that civilian role or veteran role, um, how has that been for you as as the daughter of a veteran? It feels a lot more because, uh, like, easier because when I figured out what my dad was actually doing, I would get a lot of nightmares, and I wonder if he was going to be okay. And um, now, since like he, I, he's always here, he's always in his office. I feel more safe, and I feel like 
um, I know where he is and I feel more comfortable like knowing where he is and knowing that he's okay. Yeah. yeah. And the whole movie thing for me was also weird because I it's just I had to start all over again. Mm. And I was like, okay, so how do I do this again? And with my dad being a veteran now, like my sister, I feel more comfortable um, with like all sorts of things. Like I know he's right in his office. He's not going to go back to Iraq, not for a very long time. I hope never again. And it's kind of weird to see him though in his uniform. Like I get all these flashbacks, some nightmares, some weird ideas, but I know that like, oh, he's just going to take it off again. But and sometimes in my head, I feel that he might never. So it sounds like it's definitely brought you guys a sense of more stability and peace, you know, one insecurity, you know, knowing that he's still, he's there now and he's there full time and you guys have easier access to him. And speaking of access, we do have a question from one of our viewers. Um, and the question is, you know, how often did the children get to speak to dad on Skype? So you guys mentioned um, Christelle, you mentioned all the deployments and whatnot, and, and Gabriella had mentioned, you know, previously, you know, dad being gone, and how often, or do you guys feel like it was often enough that you guys got to actually communicate with him during these deployments? Um, Gabriella, I'll shoot that over to you. Um, it wasn't very often, like, I, like four times maybe a month, yeah. and when he would, like, call, it'd be like, <sighs> like I can breathe again. Like yeah. he, he's able to call us. And I, I do remember this one thing where Yelena and I, we would get some toys from our um, playroom and we would give it to him like small things. And every time we would give it to him. And when he would deploy, he would put, put it by his rifle or something like that, take a picture and send it to us. And for me, it made me feel comfortable. Like we, we gave him a little piece of us to, and like that I'd never forget. And he would always give us a dog tag. And every night before I went to bed, I'd look at it and I'd say to myself, he's going to be okay. He knows what he's doing. I think, because I don't know what he's doing. It yeah. sounds like a lot of worry and a lot of relief from, from having to worry any longer. Do you feel like either of you get to talk about this to anyone else? I would imagine since all of you have gone through this together, maybe this isn't spoken about any longer, you're moving forward, or do you feel like a lot of your friends and family still go, wow, you guys really went through a lot. How did you do that? I mean, I've tried to talk about it at my school. People are like, I don't understand, so I don't talk about it a lot. Sometimes I don't like to talk about it just because it brings back worries and flashbacks of like, like what what happens if something goes wrong? What if he makes the wrong move? What if he turns a wrong corner? And I'm like, no, 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 no. It, he He's uh, in his office mm -hmm. drinking water and having a bag of chips in there. I don't... He's going to be fine. <laughs> <laughs> so for, for you, Yelena, did you find that um, as your dad transitioned out of the uniform and your mom had spoken about it earlier, you know, obviously there was probably a change in him, right? Because he was used to a certain, you know, battle rhythm and people calling all the time and needing him. You know, from the kid's perspective, Yelena, did you notice that same kind of difference in your dad that maybe your mom kind of spoke about with how he, you know, was a little quieter and just tr maybe trying to figure out, you know, what his role was now that he was no longer in the military? Was that something that you kind of understood and felt in his transition? Yeah, because I always remember my dad talking about, like, all his adventures he had when he would deploy and now... Like, since he's not doing that anymore, it, he usually, like, he's a lot more quiet and stuff. And we usually don't really talk about, like, him deploying, especially because most of my friends, they've never experienced that with any of their family members. Uh, and I do get, like, a lot of questions from my class. They, like, ask, like, how does it feel? And just feels like really scared because I'm always worried and wondering, is he gonna come back? 
I know. What? Oh, I'm go so ahead, sorry. Krista. The question about someone asked, uh, how often did the girls talk to uh, my husband when he was deployed? And, and it varies, I have to say, uh, depending uh, what was going on over there. Sometimes um, we had connections, sometimes we didn't. We had only Skype back then. There was no Zoom. <laughs> And whenever he was able to, and, and usually it was maybe once, sometimes twice a week. Uh, but after a couple of months of being uh, on that deployment, um, satellites were removed from the area. And so we had no longer any more Skype communication for the rest of the deployment. So it was only phone conversations and they happen every few days. It wasn't every day. And the connection the connection sometimes was real bad too. So it was hard for the kids sometimes to have a conversation with him on the phone. Yeah. I I remember talking to him and he's saying like, oh yeah, I'm gonna be okay. Like it's okay. And I'd have that nightmare. And like occasionally I'll get one very similar to when I was a kid. And the same nightmare would repeat. And I'm like, I want him to go home. And like, I don't like this. I'm like, I want it to be over with. And every time he came home, I was so grateful. <laughs> all the tears were gone. All the heart attacks were gone. <laughs> and I mean, just to hear his voice was amazing to me. Cause I was like, I, I never felt that he was safe, no matter if he was like in the safest place in the universe. Anywhere out of my family, I felt he was da he was in danger. And I have to say now, Mike works from home, <laughs> so mm -hmm. he ended up uh, uh, being from home because of COVID, and it probably will be a permanent position. So he's he's always here, which mm -hmm. is great because uh, this is probably the first summer that. The girls are here. Everyone's here. He's home. And we get to have more time, you know, as a family to do more things together. Also, one thing is that I would always get upset because we kept moving so much. So I would always have experience friends leaving me. And then I would always be super upset. But um, I also have now experienced friend like instead of me leaving my friends my friends are like left me mm -hmm. and it feels weird really like bad. That. i bet it feels weird mm -hmm. yeah well i want to yeah, ask like one last question because we're out of time here but girls if you could say in just maybe one sentence what would you recommend to kids your age who are going through a similar experience helping their father or their mother transition out of the military and becoming a veteran? If you could summarize that in one sentence. Um, I would say have faith, like they know what they're doing, they're gonna be okay, and say your Bible verses. Yep. <laughs> Very good, thanks Gabriella. Yelena, anything to add to that? I would say that they're going to be okay and that they will be safe. Very good. Well, I know we could talk a lot more about this, and Christella's going to get to hang around for another segment. But, girls, thank you so much for joining us. When we come back, we will hear from more family members of veterans. Now we want to honor retired Air Force Captain Sharisa Jackson in this month's Shadow Box segment. Tonight's Shadow Box belongs to retired U.S. Air Force Captain Sharisa Jackson. Sharisa is a veteran with 23 years of active duty military service, including 10 years as a nurse in the U.S. Air Force. Her three combat deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan inspired her commitment to help eliminate the stigma associated with PTSD. She is a passionate author and speaker, single mother of twin daughters, and a determined advocate for patients and veterans who suffer from post-traumatic stress. She currently serves as the Chief Medical Officer for AMVETS. We honor her service. We are talking to family members of veterans tonight. Do you want to be part of the conversation? We'd love to have you. Send us a message through Facebook at Veterans Voices One. Email us, veteransvoices at contracostatv.org, or call us, 925-313-1170. We'll take your phone call right now. 
I would like to ask a special favor of those of you watching us in Contra Costa County. Please take down this phone number, leave us a message after the show, tell us what you like about the show, or even what you think could be better. We would love to know how we can better serve our local veterans community. Our next guests are all spouses of veterans. Some of them are also veterans. Uh, I would like to welcome Sonia Straub, Vicki Terranini, Jade James, and Christella Hudson back to the show. Thank you, everyone. Oh, Christella, we'll have back in just a minute here. Um, so some of you are veterans, some of you are parents of veterans, some of you are spouses of veterans, and we've already talked a little bit about the experience of someone serving and transitioning out of the military. Um, but Jade, you're also a veteran, and so and you've been on the, the show before, so welcome back. Thank you. Um, what is it like being a spouse of a veteran who, and your spouse, who uh, deployed to Iraq a couple of times as well? Uh, it was a very challenging because we were in at the same time and we were missing each other on deployment, so that was really challenging. So that was that that led to her um, getting out the military. And uh, retired, well, we're not retiring, but, you know, getting out the military. And that was a big help for us and our family because now we're a little more close-knitted from that. Yeah, you have some of those common overlapping experiences, I would imagine. And Vicki, you're, you're also the spouse and the mother of a veteran or a mother of someone who's still serving on active duty. So uh, what we would call a blue star mom uh, in our local community here, what, what has your experience been as a uh, spouse of a veteran? Um, first of all, after 31 years of serving, it was very hard um, settling down. Uh, we moved to a community where there is no military, and so we lost that connection, and it was really hard. We've been here for three years, so we're still looking for orders to come and, you know, time to move. We've been here for three years now. Um, it's actually my son-in-law who's active duty. My daughter is a government service worker, um, and that for us was really hard. They spent... Um, eight years in England, and they just moved over to um, Dover Air Force Base in Delaware. So it's been nice to have them closer, and we have two great grandsons there, and so we love to go and visit, and, and just like they're on the same continent. <laughs> <laughs> and we have Sonia to bring into the conversation, but before we do, Sonia, Christella, I just saw you smiling and really shaking your head when Vicky talked about waiting for orders after three years. Um, <laughs> Do you care to share a little bit about your experience as a spouse of a veteran? You, you've you never received your own personal orders. You never wore the uniform. But yet every three years, you've had to pack everything up and move. Has it been a little hard to maybe establish those deeper roots? It has. And I have to say, uh, we moved more than, uh, than normal, I guess, because we moved every two years and sometimes every year. Uh, so in 12 years of marriage, we moved eight times. And so now we've been here, he's been retired uh, three years. So we've been back home, supposedly three years, but he's still like she, Vicky was saying, it still feels like uh, when are the orders coming in? I, I still haven't totally unpacked everything in three years that I've been here. I've been so used to carrying stuff over to the next duty station, next duty station. And, and it feels like, are we home yet? It still doesn't feel that we're totally home. It, it, I think it's going to require some more time, especially because we never really had the time sometimes to stay long enough anywhere. Uh, yeah. And by now it feels like, okay, it's going to happen anytime that we're going to have to move because it's, it's been three years. So well, it's, I just remember uh, that any time that you unpack that last box, those orders come. So never unpack the last exactly. box. Exactly. <laughs> I can totally relate to you ladies because I am currently, as I just PCS'd into Dover, Delaware myself, I definitely still have boxes that are unpacked that probably won't be unpacked because I know that in my three years here that that three-year tour will end and I will be on my way somewhere else. So I can totally understand that. So Sonia, we'd love to bring you into the conversation too and just understand a little bit more about your experience as well being a, a veteran spouse at this point. 
Yeah, I, I think the main difference here is that I um, have been with my veteran for five years, so I was not with him while he toured. Um, but I'm, I'm nodding because um, some of the big things that I am learning and have learned is that the way that um, my husband understands family and communicates love really does go back to the sandbox, right? We talk about that a lot. And, um, you know, I think the hugest takeaway this year has been, you know, can we communicate love other than I'm, I'm throwing myself in front of a bullet, which is very real for them. Um, and sort of that on the go, um, protective mode, especially during COVID has been a very challenging year. Um, I think for anybody with the, uh, warrior heart sort of quote unquote, sitting on the sidelines has been, um, triggering and and challenging and at the same time one of the most incredible things to watch um him just want to go and protect the country it's it's uh it's been very um unsettling to say the least um and i'm i'm nodding because i can see that wanting to go all the time um and it's i've worked with veterans for about 15 years been with one as a spouse for five and the things that i thought i knew uh, i did not know (laughs) Yeah. I tell people that all the time. Um, and it's an honor um, this year for families. I'm, I'm so grateful to be here and talk about it because it's been um, it's been rough for sure. Yeah, I think that's interesting, Sonia. Mm-hmm. You know, Vicki Jade and Christella have the experience of having been with that person while they're in the military. What, mm-hmm. what has it been? What has the road really been like in trying to, you know, learn the language, trying to learn the culture? Mm-hmm. You mentioned that you served with the veteran community for 15 years, so that maybe gave you a little mm-hmm. bit of insight. But coming into this from being a spouse of a veteran after they've already yeah. after they've already served, how do you ask the questions to find out what their experiences were like? And are there yeah. any hesitancies to ask? Sure. I, I always say that I speak the quote unquote Spanglish of military <laughs> because <laughs> I've been around it for a long time. Um you know, unfortunately, I think we, and fortunately, um, I, I knew enough to know that we really needed to dig into things like his VA ratings. Um, my husband's got multiple purple hearts. He wouldn't say that, but all I was hearing was these really intense stories. He was in the battle of, uh, Fallujah with infantry. It was a very intense, um, you know, season. I, I do, I spent a lot of time with military and combat and, uh, I will say my experience with the VA was very disheartening and our initial years was just finding out he couldn't hear, finding out we had TBI and PTSD and, and that looked like, uh, you know, bipolar two symptom and really understanding, um, how to be with him and how to be with us in that space. Um, and really learn how to navigate that was a huge part. Um, I don't find that I actually live in the same world as a lot of women that, have been with their husbands during deployment. We have very different um, communities, um, but I have had to reach out a lot and say, hey, I'm seeing this. Am I crazy? <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> Explain this to me. Um, I would say in general, I don't ask for a story. I wait. And then on my end, it's been learning how to hear what I, what I hear, which um, I'll say both professionally and as a wife, he has some of the most intense combat stories I've heard. Um, and, and sometimes I'm not prepared to, right. It's, it's one of these really safe feelings. Knowing you have this warrior next to you. And then can I hear the combat and go, Holy cow, this guy's next to me in bed. And he did those things and he's struggling too, right. We're both like, Holy cow. Um, and when we were dating, I was like, that's the hottest thing ever. <laughs> this guy, this is Marines, you freaking Marines. Right. And then, um, you know, and then the reality of settling into that and supporting who he is, um, it's just been a lot of learn. And fortunately, I know who to lean into, but it's been a lot of uh, a lot of work for both of us, I think. I want to bring this back to Costella, Vicky, or Jade, because Sonia just brought up issues like traumatic brain injury and PTSD. We only have about two minutes in this segment, but I know in the military, there's not a lot of room for these types of issues to exist. There's a lot of just kind of suck it up. Now that your veteran is out of the military, is there a lot more comfortability within your household or just in general of talking about things like PTSD, TBI, or combat injuries, moral injury for such? Definitely. I have to say that now he's more open to talk about it and discuss it and even get help. And that's very important. 
uh, because like you said, while you're in, you just focus on your mission. You don't focus on those things. And, and definitely that's been such a relief for him to be able to now, okay, it's time to take care of myself. But it had to, it, he had to get there with help, help from me, help from the family uh, to kind of take, take the time now to yeah. take care of yourself. And it's important because it not only helps him, but it helps the entire family. But yes, we talk, we very much openly talk about TBI, PTSD, because it's very, it's very big and it's a big problem. And, and we had had an ex- uh, stigma for so many years. And, and I think it's important. The more we talk about it, the more the guys, you know, get the message that they, it's okay and you need to get help. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Appreciate that feedback. And we actually want to continue with this conversation. We're running out of time for this segment. So Vicki and Jade, we will get you on the next segment so we can hear your response to that as well. So when we return, we'll conclude our panel with veterans families. Right now, let's take a look at the lighter side of military news with this month's scuttlebutt. Good evening. I'm your host, Corporal Schmuckatelli, and welcome to a new segment of Scuttlebutt. We got a doozy for you, just like always. This whole show's stupid. You think I really wanted to do this? You think I wanted to do this? I didn't want to do this. This is stu- Nathan, you, this whole gig was your idea, man. What is going on here, man? Hey, who the hell are you? What the f- is that? That a toothpick? Is that a m- toothpick? Uh, that's that not a not toothpick. A this place where am i all right devil i know i'm not going to talk to you until you take your god dang medication Medi- out yes your medication medication what are you talking about look on the table screwball <laughs> yeah i'm not taking this you can't make me take me alive robots Bell Warrior. Well, I'll screw you up. What's what do you want? What do you want to do? Good evening. I am your host, Corporal Schmackatelli, and welcome to a new segment of Scuttlebutt. We have a great episode laid out for you. First story, we talk about how great the VA is. I would personally like to thank them for providing me with outstanding customer service. They have prescribed me a wonderful new medication called Compliance. Call your doctor if you have high fever, stiff muscles, and confusion to address a possible life-threatening condition, or if you have uncontrollable muscle movements, as these could become permanent. Hey, Gunny Google, did we cover everything? All right, you who. Don't forget Nathan. Raw Gunny, thank you for reminding me. Yes. I would like to give special thanks to Nathan Johnson. You are very precious to me. Now we are complete. Back to you guys.
Oh boy, I hope I hope Captain Smuckatelli is all right over there. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, the VA starts issuing those medications in its in its own version of MREs. Um, so we're glad that uh, Corporal Smuckatelli is starting to take his meds now. We look forward to seeing more of him now that he's in the studio with us. So thanks for uh, watching. We hope you enjoyed that that episode of Scuttlebutt. <laughs> He seems, he seems like he's got a great uh, veteran service county officer, by yeah, the way. Yeah. He's in good hands here in Contra Costa <laughs> County. We're going to take good care of him. Don't you worry. Awesome. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. We are talking with family members of veterans, and we want to welcome you to contact us with your questions or comments. So send us a message through Facebook at Veterans Voices 1 or email at Veterans Voices at Contra Costa TV.org. You can call us as well at 925 925- 313-1170. Again, we'd like to ask a special favor for those of you watching us in Contra Costa County. Please take down this phone number and leave us a message after the show and tell us what you think, what you like about the show, or even what we can be doing better. This show exists to serve our veterans and we are always looking for improvement. So please tell us what you think. So we'd like to welcome back our panel as we continue to discuss the transition of our military families into the veteran life. And uh, we kind of left off with some great discussion in the last segment. And so uh, Jade and Vicki, we'd love to definitely hear some uh, conversation from you all uh, with regards to just the transition into this this veteran life. You know, for you, Vicki, you again served as a spouse for several, several years and you definitely got accustomed to that moving around lifestyle. So we'd love to definitely hear more from you. My husband, to jump on what Christella was saying about PTSD and Sonia also, um, my husband was a non-combatant, but he was in the war zones when he deployed. He had eight deployments. And um, he still will say something to me about, oh yeah, well, when this happened, and I'll say, wait, when did that happen? You never told me that story. So, um, you know, it's kind of, I'm still learning things about what he did when he was deployed. Uh, Not always my favorite things to hear, but we had one rule that he has to stand, be standing in front of me to tell me these things that he did because then I know he's okay. And I know he's, you know, because I could see him like in the hospital saying, oh, it's just a flesh wound, you know. So um, it, it was important to me that he was standing in front of me when he tells me these stories. That's actually a pretty neat perspective. Um you know, in a great way, I think, for the communication piece, because like you said, you're still learning about some of the things that he experienced that he he didn't necessarily share right away when they happened or shortly after he returned. And I can just attest to that for myself as a, as a military member. And, you know, for the Air Force specifically, I know we don't necessarily um, um, deal or, or get too involved in um, hands-on combat, but there are still a lot of things that happen in our world, um, you know, that, that can be traumatic for us. And so we don't necessarily feel the effects right away because we don't, um, we're not hands on combat a lot of the times, like some of our Marine brothers and our, our army brother. And so, um, that's very understandable that, you know, those, those discussions happen kind of after the fact. And, um, it sounds like Vicki, you've got a great way of handling these different revelations that come. So uh, for you, Jade, you definitely, you were an army veteran. So I know you've probably had some pretty intense um, experiences as well. And between you and your wife, who's a part of our team as well, would love to hear how you guys have kind of maneuvered through that as well. Uh, unlike the other um, guest panels, we're still working through it. You know, it's, it's not something that's easily uh, for others to uh, deal with and cope with, you know. So we're still looking for mechanisms mm-hmm. that will allow us to, you know, um, work things out between the both of us. You know, mm-hmm. both of us seen traumatic um, events. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's kind of a, a work in progress. You know, it's, it's a little slower for us um, because we're, we're both, I want to say, alpha dogs. You know, she was gung-ho and I was gung-ho. 
So we we still had that mentality in the house where, you know, we don't want to say, hey, this is bothering us or this is hurting us because we, we were always taught, you know, suck it up like uh, Nate said and drive on. So we still have that mentality. So it's a work in progress. Mm hmm. One of the things I wanted to mention that's interesting, and I, 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 I don't actually spend a lot of time with wives, but I'm uh, my husband's caregiver uh, through the VA. He, we just got 100% uh, disability after 15 years, um, and this was a, a combat wound to the head and, and several explosions later, so, and it took that long. Um, and that dynamic is interesting with the transition, for sure. Um, and I, you know, I was hearing, um, Jay talk about just household dynamic and being an alpha. I'm an executive outside of the house, so I can get a little bit intense too. And he's, a, uh, you know, in E6. And so we, we definitely can, can butt heads. And then there's this caregiver role that I know several spouses, uh, hundreds of thousands are, we feel like a very unseen, uh, sort of force in the world. It's, um, it can be very intense and the most rewarding you know, thing on the planet, but in terms of marriage, it's a, it's a lot to unpack that. I think that leads to a couple of questions that I have and I'll try to ask them at the same time, but in hopes that you can abs- maybe answer them separately. Um, to what extent do you feel like you're able to get involved in helping this person through these transitions, uh, both that say like the VA level, does the VA welcome you as a part of that process uh, or does the veteran welcome you as a part of that process? And then separately, my second question would be, this role as a caregiver for this veteran, do you feel like that makes it difficult in any way to turn towards yourself and start caring for your experiences? And, you know, we heard from the girls a lot of fear and a lot of anxiety. And so, you know, as family members, you may have not been in the combat zone yourselves, but you've experienced certainly heightened levels of emotions and such. And so is there time allotted even if there's not a system like the VA, is there time allotted for taking care of your own needs? I can say that um, I had to start looking into that too for myself because in my case, I was, uh, well, oh, I am taking care of my husband, taking care of the kids too, and I was always last. In my case, I just, like him, for when he was uh, active duty, suck it up and focus on the mission. For me, was don't deal with my emotions, just we need to survive. When I need to take care of these kids while he was gone, and he was gone almost always. Uh, and so I never took the time to take care of myself because there wasn't time for that. And now that he retired, that he's home, it's almost like, okay, now I'm dealing with all this, all the fears. And it's, it's also trauma for us because while they're deployed, you don't know if they're going to make it home back alive. So in, in, in my case, I always say, I always tell my family and friends that I had to have, I always live with a plan. If something happened, mm-hmm. what do I do? Mm-hmm. With mm-hmm. Kids, where do I go? Because he deployed from every duty station that we lived in and usually was in our home. I'm from New York. He's from California. And so I always had a plan. What do I do? Mm-hmm. And it's hard to live like that. Mm-hmm. And, and so now that he's finally opening up and sharing some of the stories and I can understand a little bit of, you know, what he, what he experienced. Um, I also experienced war, not in this country. I come from El Salvador and I lived during the civil war over there. I was a child when the war started. So I have our understanding for what my kids were going through in some ways, except that I was in the middle of the war zone. Um, so now it's been kind of hard for me to figure out what to do because everyone's home. I'm not in high alert. We're moving, we're packing, he's deploying. Where are we going? What am I doing? And so it's important that you take the time and take the time to take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. Sometimes our spouses don't do it. And, Mm -hmm. and, and it's very important for everyone's health, mental health, that we deal with. And, and that's my advice right now. There's a lot there that you said, and I really appreciate you sharing that. Um, certainly relatable for me as well. I, I was a military spouse as well and raised my son in the military. Um, and like I said, I was raising it myself. And there are a couple things too that um, were important to note here. 
the trauma was felt by everybody. So even though the military member might have been the one overseas, you know, dealing with the combat or dealing with, you know, just the deployed environment, the families back home were also feeling a sense of trauma too, based off of just how they reacted and how they had to worry and just the different anxieties like Nathan had mentioned earlier. And then there's now this time period where those things have now settled down and everybody, now we can focus on a real healing, you know, and caretaking and whatnot. And so I really appreciate that you all share that and being very transparent and vulnerable about it too because now it's like the aftermath we are now in the aftermath phase of our lifestyle and now we're having to pick up the pieces Um, I do want to bring up something that a viewers asked here what's been the best resource for helping your veteran maybe some relatives churches you know um, just what do you think has been very helpful for you know, just the healing process in general for you guys. Yeah. Or helping yourselves, helping the veteran or yourselves, I'd say I'd add to that question. I'd have to say the VFW, my husband was the chaplain. So he was the person everybody. Wow. Um, So, you know, he was kind of limited on who he could go to. Um, He was always a friend with the base psychologist and they would meet once a month and kind of, um, debrief each other without giving away details but um i find for him he's very involved in the vfw in our town and that's really helping him because he still has that connection to some of the um military people and you know people who understand what he has been through as well Mm -hmm. We, I have to, um, the VA has been rough for me to navigate. I don't find it um, that open. Um, I have to pit bull in, which I'm happy to do. Um, at this point, I am um, learning the brotherhood of the Marines. You know, we, we've lost about two guys from his unit a year since I've known him to suicide and things. It's been intense. And the best thing ever is that band of brothers that I can call and they come and take care of me. And it's pretty magical. Being a, a wife has been amazing in that regard took all his brothers and sisters that's actually a really good point they're still staying connected you know even Mm -hmm. though they're not wearing the uniforms anymore it's going to be a family for life type of situation (laughs) christella i'm sorry i didn't mean to cut you off there that's what i was going to say too staying connected uh it's Mm -hmm. so important uh no matter where you are in the world the marines can be all over the place Uh, Mm um connecting and connecting on special dates for them and mm-hmm. maybe a random day for everybody, but for them, it's a special day, something meaningful that happened while they mm-hmm. were deployed and connecting mm-hmm. during those times. And I have to say, faith and staying active, doing the things that they liked doing, that they never had the chance doing before. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and now they have the time to do it and, and just taking the time to do those things that make them happy. Uh, whatever that is, my husband decided to start playing golf. He hated golf. Now he likes it. <laughs> We have just about a minute. Uh, Jade, any final thoughts on what you might share with another spouse uh, of a veteran? Yes, uh, I would like to piggyback on what um, Christella and and Sonia said about um, supporting uh, a support, um, a support base for your wife or your spouse, should I say. My wife never stopped giving when she got out, she always kept giving with the military. So she never departed from the military. She always worked for Wounded Warrior Project. So that was her release of helping her cope with um, what she was going through with other veterans. So that to me is amazing that that connectedness and and still staying very purposeful in your military um, connection is, is key. It's huge for healing. Cause a lot of the times you get out and you lose your identity. Like, you know, we've heard earlier, you're not sure what your purpose is anymore because you've taken your uniform off. So that sounds like a great way to stay connected. So I want to tell you guys, thank you so much for being on. We've hope you've enjoyed our conversation with these families and veterans later in the show. We'll show a list of resources um, for our veteran family members, but now we invite you to hear, a veteran's voice this month veterans voices correspondent noga kessler talks with marine veteran ethel spencer welcome to a veteran's voice Uh, i'm noga kessler veterans voices correspondent and today we have with us a very very special treat we have miss ethel spencer 
She served in the United States Marine Corps from 1943 to 1946. Welcome, Ms. Spencer, welcome. Thank you. So maybe we can begin uh, today with sharing how, how you came about to, to join uh, the Marine Corps in, in the 1940s. Well, it was, um, I was in Los Angeles and I went by the recruitment station for the Marine Corps. And I went in and talked a little bit and then I was sworn in. <laughs> and it was just the spur of the moment. What year uh, was that, ma'am? 1943. 1943, yeah. And um, then I, um, I wasn't actually called to duty until February of 44. I had orders to be in Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, for boot camp. And after boot camp, I went through motor transport school and then got orders for um, Marine Corps base in San Diego, California. And that was really a blessing. <laughs> <laughs> and we went across, they took us across by rail at that time in old cattle cars that were fixed up with bunks three high. Uh, that was for transporting troops at that time. And then, of course, I got to San Diego, and um, we were issued uniforms and orientation and so on. And then it was just a, a few days, or maybe two, maybe two days, and then we started driving wherever they wanted us, you know, to drive. We had drove all kinds of Marine Corps vehicles, and there were about at that time, there were about 100 um, women marine drivers on the base. Uh, only, I think, only four men driving. We drove all kinds of vehicles, uh, transporting troops, transporting sea bags, transporting food from the commissary uh, to other bases, and so on. And there were two. We there were two barracks. Each barracks had four squadrons, and there was I, I think about eighty people to a squadron. Well, those two barracks were full of Navy Marines. Were you in contact with units that had served abroad during the war and they came back? Or uh, did any of them come um, through? Where you oh yes, yeah. driving. I mean, we would be in contact with the. The male Marines at that time, and uh, we'd sometimes meet them at the ship, and sometimes take them to a Navy hospital if there wasn't anything that needed an ambulance. Um, we took them for uh, they would they would have us take them to different buildings, you know, before they were uh, discharged. And of course, they all had sea bags and and. Uh, it was very interesting because some of those had been over there a long time and uh, without any R&R, &R, which they called resting and <laughs> recreation. But yes, we were in contact with a lot of them. And um, what would you say was your most memorable experience during that time? I'm sure there's a number of them, but Really, that just kind of stands out to, that you that you think about perhaps <clears throat> when when they the war when the war was over in August of forty five, um, I uh, I went to uh, pick up a load of Marines that were going to sea school at the coast. Uh, they go over for the day and come back, and I went to pick them up. And at that time, I knew the war was over. And so coming back, uh, they were all hollering to stop whenever we went by a bar. <laughs> they all to get out. And they, they'd holler to stop. And they'd beat on the top of the, the pickup or the truck top. But I couldn't stop because... Um, 
I would have been in trouble. I mean, they were recruits and they didn't have liberty or anything. So they got taken to the base where they were mm. supposed to be. <laughs> yeah. But I remember that distinctly. But you remember the the just the joy in the air and everybody excited. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. So um, go ahead. Um, so uh, after 1946, um, maybe you could share a little bit after you, you left the military, how, Marine Corps, how, yes. how was that for you? Um, the transition, let's say, uh, you know, out of, out of that, uh, you know, environment. And... Well, it wasn't, it wasn't too hard because um, I met him, he was, he was, he wasn't my husband at the time, but I mean, I met him in the Marine Corps, and I was out uh, in June. We were married, mm -hmm. and I was out in the Marine Corps. So then I still we still followed the Marine Corps because mm -hmm. he stayed in and retired, and we went from coast to coast and you know, had two children, and and uh, it was. I always liked the Marine Corps, yeah. and, and he did too, and 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 it was a it was nice. Yeah. So from from a Marine, and you're always a Marine, but from a Marine to also a Marine Corps uh, wife, I guess. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, I would love to share um, with our viewers um, how old you're going to be on August first, ma'am. How old will you be on August first? August 25th. Oh, 25th. I'm sorry. August 25th. How old will you be? I will be 100. Ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> it's incredible. You are, you are absolutely <laughs> um, a treasure. And we're so, so happy to be able to, to hear a little bit of your story as a female Marine in the 1940s, ma'am. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you for tuning in to the show tonight. We hope you found our discussion with veterans family members informative and inspiring. We leave you with some resources for the families of those who have served. The American Legion Auxiliary is a community of volunteers serving veterans, military, and their families. Get in touch with them at member.legion-aux.org. It is the mission of the Veterans of Foreign Wars Auxiliary to improve the lives of veterans and their families. Learn more at vfwauxiliary.org. Vet centers are a great place to find resources for the families of those who served. Find a vet center near you at vetcenter.va.gov or call 877-927-8387. Veterans Voices is brought to you in part by contributions from the Veterans Affordable Home Program, serving those who have served us, ensuring the American dream for our veterans, the Diablo Valley Veterans Foundation, dedicated to helping veterans near you, American Legion Post 246, honoring the tradition of the American Legion in Danville. To rewatch tonight's episode, check back on our homepage later this week or check your cable provider's schedule for rebroadcast times. You can also rewatch this episode and many others on our YouTube channel, Veterans Voices of Contra Costa. So be sure to subscribe. Our next show will air on Monday, August 9th at 7 p.m. We will talk with veterans caregivers. Be sure to tune in. It's going to be a great show. To all of our veterans and their families, thanks for watching and have a great evening. <laughs>